This happened to me over the course of probably eight to 10 years. To my knowledge, nobody ever died in or around my house. But my parents did have my grandfather's ashes in their closet. If that maybe has anything to do with this, I'm not sure. The first account I can clearly remember was when I was about six. Super young, but I can still remember the night vividly. I woke up in the middle of the night and wanted a little snacky snack. So I walked to the kitchen in the dark and grabbed a banana off the counter. I noticed the light in our backyard was on. So I looked out the sliding glass doors and I saw a man standing out there facing the doors. He looked kind of like a pirate. Like I said, I was super young, so I'm not 100% sure, but I know he was wearing a giant black hat. It's what I focused on the most. I wasn't necessarily scared, but more shocked that someone was out there so late and I didn't recognize him. I looked down to open my banana and when I looked back up, the strange man was gone. I didn't think much about it and I just went back to my room to eat my snack. But thinking back now, it was definitely creepy. If it was not a ghost of some kind, then there was just some strange man wandering around our backyard at night. The second creepy thing that I remember, I'm not even sure was paranormal, but who knows. I was about 7 or 8 and my brother would have been 10 or 11. Our mom left us home alone for a few hours while she took our little sister for grocery shopping with her. It was a super rainy stormy day, so I figured it was probably easier for her to just look after one kid in the store. And we were old enough to watch TV and not get into any trouble while she was gone for a bit. So anyways, our dog started going insane at the window in the living room that faced the front yard and street. We live in the suburbs, lots of houses around us. My brother and I, curious obviously to what the dog was freaking out over, went to the window and peeked through the blinds. We saw someone dressed in all black, literally looked like someone wearing a black gimp suit or something, crouching in our tree branches outside the window. We watched for a few seconds and then whoever it was must have been scared off and jumped out of the tree and ran to my neighbor's house and jumped their fence. My brother and I called my mom and told her about what we saw and she came home as soon as she could to make sure we were safe and we never found out who or what that was. The reason I think this might be paranormal is that nobody's house was ever broken into and that person or thing moved with almost superhuman speed. They jumped from the tree and over the fence in maybe five seconds. Plus, it was insanely rainy and windy, and who cares about a joint in those conditions? The last few things that happened to me when I was way older, 14. I forced my brother to live in the garage so I could finally have my own room. My sister and I have shared since she was born, and she was a slob. So I would constantly be blamed for her mess, and I was fed up. So anyways, I started mini construction on my new room, painted the walls, ripped out the carpet, etc. This is when I would wake up covered in scratches and bruises I couldn't explain. I don't sleepwalk. I do sleep on my side and sometimes turn over, but I don't do any crazy flailing. And I never had long nails, so I didn't scratch myself. The nights that I would stay up late, I would hear weird scratching in the walls and sometimes banging. Nobody else ever heard anything though. I also would sometimes feel a weird sensation like I was being watched or listened to when I was all alone. I would also hear my mom call my name when I would be home alone, walking around the house. Not much past that though, except I really wanted to try a Ouija board and my dad would not allow it. He grew up in a haunted house and his sisters would do seances and make things worse. I'm now 21 and I haven't had any more notable experiences. I'm still in the same house, same room. I really just tried not acknowledge whatever it was in hopes it would stop. And it did. For now. My dad grew up in a small town in Vermont. His childhood home was an old hospital that had been renovated into a house. He's told me quite a few stories of unexplainable things that happened there. This one, however, is probably the most bone-chilling thing that's ever happened there. My dad's sisters would sometimes hold seances with their friends from school. And one time in particular, they decided to skip school and do one in a closet upstairs while 
Everyone else was gone. Two of his sisters and a girl from school piled into the closet and shut the door. During the seance, my aunt A asked if there's anyone here, please make yourself known. Immediately, my other aunt S felt a hand on her back. She jumped to the side a little bit and A saw the hand coming out of a box on the floor. She said it looked dead, grey and rotting. The girls freaked out and ran to the closet. Doors and cabinets were slamming in the house and they were so scared, they just ran out of the house and left it empty for hours. My dad came home from school and saw the front door wide open, so we figured someone was home and was calling for A and S, asking why they left the door wide open. With no answers, he thought maybe they were messing with him. He was the youngest and often his sisters would pick on him. He walked around the house yelling for them, saying it's not funny and he didn't want to play along with their stupid games. When he got upstairs, he heard a bedroom door slam. He went to the door and tried to open it, but it wouldn't budge. He banged on the door. This isn't funny. Come on, just open the door. No answer. He tried to turn the knob and pull as hard as he could, but it still wouldn't budge. He put his leg on the wall as leverage and pulled back and finally got the door open with just a crack. He peeked through the crack and saw nothing. There was nothing there. Nobody holding the door. Nobody messing with him. Then the door was ripped away from him, shutting itself again and he fell onto the ground. He was shocked. He got up and tried to open the door once again and it opened with no resistance this time. He inspected the room and nobody was there. Super creeped out, he went downstairs and found his sisters coming back home. He asked them what kind of game they were playing with him and they looked scared. They told him that they hadn't been home for hours because of what they had seen that morning and they were not messing with him. The house actually mysteriously burned down years after this when they were all adults. And I'm pretty sure there was also a small graveyard close by where the old hospital used to bury bodies. His mom, who's passed away now, two of his sisters and he has had many experiences in that house. However, most of them were not aggressive as this one. I think that the seance really woke something up that day. Back in October of 2017, my band and I were in the middle of our two week long European tour. It was a great experience, however, what I experienced there will probably be with me the rest of my life. In fact, it's something I can't rationalise or explain to myself. Anyway, here's some backstory. There were four of us, driving around Europe in a Honda Jazz, all the way from Scotland, plus musical equipment and clothes. Some venues, including this one, would offer accommodation and food on top of our fee, which was amazing. And you can imagine, after being in cramped conditions on that road for nine hours at a time, we weren't really wanting to turn anything like that down. After our gig, some of the band wanted to go out and see the local nightlife, whereas myself, I just wanted to lie down, relax and just browse the internet. As we were coming to the end of the tour and I was in need of some downtime, we were led up to our room which was above the bar, which we assumed would be a very basic room with a bed and bathroom, and led us into one of the most modern Airbnbs I've ever stayed in. It was super clean, super high tech, two big massive bedrooms with king sized beds with a shower and jacuzzi bath, massive kitchen and beautiful wooden floors. I decided to sleep on the floor of the living slash kitchen room on my blow up mattress, which was open planned and the Lincoln communal room to the bedrooms and bathrooms. As my bandmates were getting ready to go out on the town, I saw a leaflet on the kitchen table that said that this building has been around since 60, 1260, which was as incredible as you would never know as the building and bar had been renovated, to the point that you didn't really see any of the old designs anymore. I said goodbye to my bandmates, and one of them mentioned they were going to have a bath when they got back. I shrugged off and asked them to be quiet and not to try and wake me, as my bed was really close to all the doors as it was in the middle of the communal room. After they'd left, I turned over and went to sleep pretty quickly. I woke to the sound of a dripping tap. It was pretty dark, but my eyes adjusted fast. The lights of the city were coming through the cracks in the blinds. 
My first reaction was being mad at my bandmate for not turning the taps off properly after he had a bath. Turns out later, he never ended up having one. I turned over and saw it was about 3.30am and on the war clock. I threw the blankets over my head and closed my eyes again. Then it happened. What almost felt like a large weight came down on the bottom left corner of my bed. If you've ever been on a bouncy castle, and when weight is distributed from one side and inflates the opposite side, except this launched me about an inch in the air. This was the first time I had felt real, sobering fear, like an ice shock down my spine, probably the adrenaline in hindsight. I remember I stopped breathing, my heart was racing and it was silent in the room. I felt it again, this time less abrupt, more like a kid nudging you through attention. I remember thinking, this isn't in your mind. This is actually happening. Terrified, I threw the blankets off me and looked down towards the foot of my bed. I didn't see anything at first until I looked further back beyond the dining table, which was maybe two feet from the foot of my bed. I noticed a shape. I blinked several times to be sure, but I swear I saw a girl with no face and long hair down to her feet. She was about five, six, pale as anybody could be, and she almost looked sodden, as if she'd been in the rain. I tried to scream, but I couldn't, and I threw the blanket over myself and told myself to go to sleep. I don't remember falling asleep, but when I woke up, I saw one of my bandmates sitting at the dining room table, doing some work on his laptop. I was so relieved it was daytime. I sprang up immediately and told him what happened. Of course... Half asleep and rantings of a ghost, he told me it was a dream and to calm down. My other bandmate Gary, who had slept in one of the bedrooms, woke up and joined us. He looked pale as a sheet. I asked him if he was okay, but assumed he was just hung over from last night's antics. When we packed our things, two of the boys went and got the car, while Gary and I minded our belongings in the lobby over a cigarette and coffee. I asked Gary how he slept, and before I could say anything, he replied... Mate, you would not believe me if I told you. I stared at him for a couple seconds and asked what had happened, thinking it was a bar story or a funny story perhaps. I couldn't have been more wrong. Let's also state that Gary and I are skeptics, which doesn't mean we don't believe in ghosts, just that we're the type of people that need proof before blindly believing anything. He began to tell me in the middle of the night someone had got into bed with him. He had awoken to the feeling of the blanket lifting up and someone sliding in next to him. He told me that he was too terrified to move or call out and just tried to make himself fall asleep like me. And he never had the bath he intended to take. So that explained why he looked pale white when he woke up. He was not intending to tell anyone because it sounded so unbelievable. We stared at each other for a while and said we'd never sleep another night in Zurich. So without giving too much detail, I did a four and a half year stint as a security contractor for a company which is pretty well known and well regarded in the industry. During the 2014 invasion of the Crimean Peninsula, after it was determined Russian contractors were being used to invade the peninsula, a certain worldwide military organization decided to be cheeky and send contractors of its own. And I, an 18 year old, only a few months out of this company's boot camp, was sent along with a sizable force of other contractors. Our primary mission was to slow any progress the Russians made while evacuating towns and villages of pro-Ukrainian residents who were susceptible to executions and other horrendous acts when their loyalty was discovered. Now, I only had six miserable weeks, and neither of these stories are my own, but the sources are very reliable people, and I trust that they wouldn't lie about such things. So the first one I'll tell is of Platoon 62. Platoon 62 comprised two squads of 12 men each and was solely tasked with evacuation duties. According to the two people who had told me what happened, P62 had called in at approximately 2.45pm and notified command that they had encountered heavy incoming fire and that they'd be seeking an alternate route to their destination and reported no casualties. At 252 they called in again and advised the one truck had been hit by an explosive 
and that the vehicle was immobile. They said they'd be dismounting and moving to another vehicle, reporting that all five occupants had been injured but were able to move on their own. Multiple attempts to reach them fail after this. Two hours go by, and then the last call from them came in saying they'd all been wounded, some dead, and that they needed a medevac. 60 additional contractors forming a QRF were sent to assist at the first sign of trouble at 2.45. And at approximately 6 o'clock, they had finally arrived only to find all 24 dead in varying locations. So here's where the paranormal begins. The locals state that a firefight had in fact started at around 2.45 and ended after about an hour with the attackers making an aggressive push on the two squads they'd ambushed. The locals state that they'd just gone out and checked on the contractors after the attackers had left and found several who were still alive but life-saving attempts failed shortly after. Most had been hit by gunfire and shrapnel multiple times. Fearing the attacking forces would return, the locals left. The locals were adamant that they had checked all 24 and that all had passed away before they had left. So who called in saying they needed medivac? It's possible someone lived and they didn't realise he was still alive. And he, Roy, benevited himself long enough to call for help. It's entirely possible the locals lied, or my fellow contractors lied, but regardless, I do know this Platoon 62, not their real call sign by the way, was lost on that date and at that time. All 24 were killed in an ambush because they had gone down a road we knew had been mapped out for ambushes. We know most of their equipment was damaged in the ambush, including most comms. And that the official information release states there were signs indicating someone had tried to save a few of them. Regardless of what happened, whether or not that last call for medevac that ever came in, we lost 24 great guys that day, just trying to save lives. Task Force Blitz, or TF Blitz, or just Blitz as we call it, was a slow down task force formed to do as mentioned above, and that was to slow down any advancement made by the Russians. Composed of 150 contractors, it was formed early on, but my squad wasn't attached until I had been in the country for about three weeks. None of this matters to the story, it just provides some background. It was not uncommon to be given maps that were heavily outdated, or that were not complete, leading to confusion when we stumbled upon roads or villages that were not marked on our maps. Also, it's important to know that GPS was working, but due to the weather at the time, most of our GPS units were not functioning properly or reliably, hence why we relied on maps. While en route to an assignment, the units in the front of our column reported a small cluster of approximately 20 houses and buildings, approximately half a mile east from the road we were on. Of course, our maps didn't show this village. It was decided early on that since we couldn't confirm previous teams had searched this village, we had to search it again. And so my squad of 10 and another of 10 dismounted and approached joined by two armed interpreters. My squad approached from the southwest, the other from the northwest, maintaining comms while approaching, we identified a gas station, about 15 total homes and apartment buildings, what looked to be a government type building, and three buildings I couldn't possibly identify. So little by little we clear each building. Unfortunately, we find a few deceased people along the way. The researchers on our end find nothing. As we're wrapping up, the other squad comes out with two children and a dog. All three appear to be emaciated, and our medics began treatments while we established a defensive perimeter and waited for an evacuation platoon to come. The children were picked up, we carried on. Later on, I got to talk to the guys who found the children and dog, and this is where the paranormal begins. Whilst clearing out one of the apartment buildings, the members of the other squad who found them, who I'll call D, interpreter, D, T and P, T and P were point while D covered the rear. All three encountered a locked apartment door. T and P confirmed the door handle was locked and door was firm in the closed position, so they prepared to breach it with a halogen when the door simply popped open before we could even get the bar in the door jam inside. They heard what they perceived as an elongated whisper, which D stated was loud enough for him to determine 
it was something said in Ukrainian. He just couldn't confirm what exactly was said. They proceeded to hold their positions until additional contractors came to them. They entered the apartment and searched and found the two kids and dog in the living room closets, covered by several items of thick clothing. A woman was found down the hallway in a bedroom. She had been deceased for several days, if not a week at that point. Her injuries believed as a result of a brutal assault. After the fact, before hearing the story, it was confirmed an evac platoon had visited this village about five days before, followed two days later by another task force. Neither reported finding the children or woman when clearing the village. Though it was determined later on, members of that evac platoon had committed crimes against women and children, and the time frame of when they were there lines up with her death. What stands out is the locked door. They confirmed amongst themselves it was locked, and they were willing to risk any element of surprise, both to that apartment and every, everyone they hadn't cleared to break the door down because it simply popped open. I will say, T and I worked together several times after our time in Ukraine, and he established himself as a great contractor, and he exhibited a great moral character. I know from my time with him, he wouldn't feed into a lie, so I truly believe this happened. As far as knowing truly why that door popped open, I believe that woman in the afterlife waited for her kids to greet them as they crossed over, knowing she couldn't save them, and did her best to protect them by locking the door when she saw our boys coming down the hallway. Perhaps they realised they were different. Perhaps she took a chance, hoping they'd save her kids. Regardless, the last I heard, only the dog passed away, so she can rest, knowing we saved them. I was a security contractor for four and a half years and worked both stateside and overseas. Most of our stateside contracts have us doing what someone describe as military police duties, just on a private level. So we do access control, patrolling, respond to 911 calls on facility grounds, etc. Most of these locations are pretty rural, located in the western half of the United States. The kind of places where you can still see the stars at night. This event happened in 2015, around May, and was probably one of the most WTF moments of my career at that point. Myself and another contractor, Ty, were manning an entry point to a facility located approximately four miles away behind us. In front of us was approximately two miles of semi-flat barren ground, ended only by some hills, and behind us was the perimeter fence, approximately nine feet high, topped with barbed wire with the earth behind that matching the earth in front of us. So on a sunny day or at night with a bright enough light, you could easily see 1500 feet in any direction, with little to no concealment to anything larger than an extremely small animal. We sheltered in a small 12 by eight shack, powered with electricity and that had running water. The front and side windows could be popped out and upwards, allowing fresh air in. So it's about 2.20 in the morning. We're sitting at around 60 degrees. Ty and I decided to turn the lights off both inside and outside of the shack so we could see the landscape better. It was a moonless night, slightly cloudy. The kind of night for perfect for camping, but it was dark. I mean, beyond 75 feet, you couldn't really see anything besides lights off in the extremely far off distance. As we sat there waiting for nothing, liking posts on social media, we both distinctly heard what sounded like a large quadrupedal animal approaching the shack, which was odd because neither of us had been briefed on anything like this occurring at this specific facility we were guarding. As we both turned around and began to look out the windows, neither of us could see anything, but it got louder, almost like it was getting closer. At this point, you'd expect to see at least an outline of something because it sounded like it was easily within 50 feet of us, but nothing. We both were confused and justifiably concerned. Neither of us talked. We just listened and communicated with our concerned looks. This is what really fucks with my head, and to this day, the closer it got, the slower the steps got, and eventually, it sounded like it went from being quadrupedal to bipedal, I'm talking it sounded like someone was now within 10 feet of our shack, just 
just casually walking around it. Believing our eyes to be deceiving us, we use the lights on our rifles to begin to illuminate the area, searching our respective sectors and looking for anything. These lights were bright, the beams easily reaching out 250 feet, not leaving much to the imagination, and yet, nothing. Not a single thing or person, but yet once we turned the lights off, the footsteps continued. I would have bet money I was dreaming it if I was alone, but I wasn't. I had someone with me confirming what I was experiencing was real. We began to talk amongst ourselves. Night vision. Since we were working on a night post, we directed to bring our issued night vision goggles with us. So we use those and start scanning. And we literally cannot see a damn thing. But we can still hear the footsteps. At this point, we actually are so concerned for our safety, we request help. In the meantime, we leave the shack, helmets on, night vision on, and search the immediate area. It's important to note the night vision provided less long distance vision than the flashlights. We disengaged the ENVGs and went back to the flashlights. I mean, we searched, kicked over rocks, tapped out feet in divots, seeing if there was a secret hatch. Nothing. It took our backup 20 minutes to arrive in the form of two half-asleep supervisors and an ATV. Kind of agreed to make something up, anything reasonable. We heard these footsteps for roughly 15 minutes total, and I honestly don't know what it could have been. I worked the shack like four times before then, and a handful of times after, and nothing similar happened. When I was little, my family and I lived in this small house on the outskirts of Houston. The way the house was laid out was you would walk in from the front door, and to your left was the kitchen and breakfast nook. Forward was the living room with the dining area behind it, and to your right was a long hallway that led to my two brothers' room, my parents' room, and my room. My mom raised us Catholic and blessed our house regularly, and my dad as well was very superstitious. The house itself was somewhat old, being built in the 60s or 70s. Anyway, my first experience in the house happened when I was around maybe five or six. Since I was born, I always had my own room and my two brothers shared a room which was right next to mine. One night, I woke up needing to pee really bad. The bathroom was located right in the center of the long ass hallway. It was in the middle of the night, so the hallway was pitch black. The only light source was my series of night lights. I stood at the end of the hallway, staring towards the living room. I remember a feeling of intense fear and seeing a tall, dark figure crouch down and move towards me. I screamed, walking literally every person in the house. That night and about a year after, I always slept in my parents' room. As the years went by, my older brother and I started experiencing things that no one else except our family dog seemed to notice. It was always little things. Doors would open and slam shut, the TV would turn off and on, and we could hear walking in the attic. My dad would try to explain to us that the footsteps in the attic were from raccoons. Being kids, we believed it was raccoons because why would dad lie about it? Found out years later, he only told us that to keep us and himself from getting scared. So one day, my mum and dad were at work, leaving my two brig brothers and myself alone in the house. My brothers were outside playing basketball, and I was inside watching TV. I was about eight or nine at the time. The TV randomly switched to the static channel. I flipped the channel back to what I was watching, ignoring the sudden creep of fear crawling up my spine. The TV switched back again and I turned it off. From where I was sitting, I could almost see the end of the hallway felt that something was there, in my brother's room. I got up and walked up the hallway and stared down the, by my brother's door. The doorknob turned and I froze. I was the only one inside the house, yet I felt I wasn't alone. The door cracked open and when it did, it felt like the hallway darkened. I bolted outside to get my brothers. I told them what happened and when they went inside to check it out, I remember both of them running out and telling me that we're going to play basketball until our parents got home. 
about a year later was the scariest moment shared by my brother and I. We had a sudden falling out with my dad's side of the family. My grandma was sick and dying at the time, which was causing a lot of animosity in my family. One night, I couldn't sleep. I kept seeing a creepy face in my closet, which was keeping me from being able to turn the lights off and go to sleep. I had this sudden feeling that I needed to look outside. I slept under a window that overlooked the backyard. My brother had the same window in their room. I sum up all my courage and glance out the window. It was in the middle of the night and the backyard was lit only by moonlight. However, we had a yellow slide that stuck out even in the darkness. I stared out for a little bit until I noticed something sitting on the side. The figure on the slide had its knees drawn up with its arms wrapped around its legs. Long bird-like wings and a long beak. The figure was so dark, so pitch black. It stood out even in the darkened backyard. The thing opened its eyes, which were blood red, and lifted its head quickly to stare at the window next to mine, where my brother was. And after about a minute, it slowly turned to stare at my window. When it did, it felt like a sharp icicle went through my soul. I screamed for my dad. He went outside to look, and nothing was there. That morning, my dad got the call that my grandma had passed away in the night. After that day, things on my dad's side went from bad to ugly. Old, horrible secrets came out, and my brother started to act out while I became more timid and sleep-deprived. It wasn't until years later, when we had moved to another house and were practically grown, that we spoke about that night. We were smoking a blunt, talking about scary things that happened in our old house. Like my dad would wake up to something standing over him a lot, and he would hear things in the attic. Spooky shit. I told him about the demon bird thing, and he turned super pale. He explained in detail what the creature looked like. Things that I never told my parents. It clicked to me that whatever that thing was, made direct eye contact with my brother. And when it turned to stare at me, I screamed. My other brother tried to tell us that we were just fucked up and watched too many scary stories. But I know what I saw. He saw too. I haven't had too many paranormal encounters after that. Just a few here and there. But I'll always think back to that one night. That one scary ass night. I still wonder, nearly 20 years have passed since I saw that creature. What it was. And why it was in our backyard. Growing up, I lived with my mom, dad, and two older brothers. We lived in a house that was built in the mid-70s or early 80s. We always felt there was something more to that house. I would always talk about someone I would call the Shadow Man. My first experience with this entity was when I was about five or six. I had woken up one night to use the bathroom, which was located in the exact centre of a long hallway that leads to the living room, kitchen, etc., I opened my door and stepped out. I remember feeling terrified, staring at the darkened hallway. Everyone was asleep and the house was dark. It was properly close to 3am. I could see this tall, dark figure standing at the end of the hallway watching me. I was frozen with fear. My dad was pretty tall himself, 6'4", but was pretty heavy. This thing was as tall as the ceiling and skinny with long arms. The thing crouched down to my level and charged at me. I screamed and everyone woke up. I was so scared I refused to sleep alone for nearly a year. So one night when I was about seven, I was sleeping on the love seat my parents had in their bedroom. It was located by the door to the hallway and parallel to the master bathroom. I woke up, my body was numb. I couldn't move, I couldn't talk, I could only stare. This was my very first experience with sleep paralysis. I laid on the couch, staring at the tall, skinny, dark figure that was stood in front of the bedroom door, by my feet. I tried to call for my dad, but I couldn't. I was stuck. I felt like I was suffocating. Suddenly, my dad yells out, he sleeps a lot, Leave her alone! Get out! I quickly sit up and jump from the couch to my parents' bed, waking both of them up. 
I laid between my parents trying to go back to sleep, but I couldn't. I could see the shadow man walk from the door to the bathroom and then to the closet located next to my dad. My dad started mumbling like he was having a nightmare and suddenly woke up. He got up to use the bathroom, but before he did, he opened and turned on the closet light. He thought I was sleeping, but really, I was wide awake. So through the course of about 11 years, I would wake up about a few minutes before 3am in sleep paralysis, and he would always be there, hanging out in the corner of the dark room I was in. It didn't happen all the time, but enough to have me scared of the dark until my teen years. So fast forward to my sophomore year of high school, we had since moved out of that house, and I hadn't seen or dreamt about the shadow man in years. So one night, I sneaked out with some friends and went to this abandoned house on my friend's street. We take acid, and my friends start spray painting on the walls. I was feeling my trip, we were jamming out, smoking a joint, when I suddenly got that chill. The one that told me he was there. I don't remember most of my trip, but I do remember seeing the shadow man poke his head about from around the corner, and I screamed. My friends made fun of me the next day, telling me I was freaking out because the shadow man was watching. After that, I hadn't seen or felt him. I met my fiancé, we moved in together and all was happy. It had been years since that night and I thought to myself, finally, he fucked off. So one night, this happened last year, my fiancé and I moved our bed to the living room. We did this a lot because we would always pass out in the living room watching TV or movies. We were sleeping and I had this dream that I was sleeping in my old room. I turned to look at my fiancé and he was in my bed, sound asleep. I tried to get up and was hit with sleep paralysis. I tried to stay calm as I knew I was dreaming and I would wake up soon until I glanced at the corner. There he was, standing, watching. I felt so scared I couldn't breathe. I looked back at the ceiling, telling myself to wake up. I could see the ceiling of my apartment, but the walls were of my old bedroom. I was trying desperately to nudge my fiancé to wake him up, but I was frozen and felt intense pressure all over. Finally, after what felt like hours, I was able to move my hand just a smudge and touched his back. The second my hand made contact with him, I was snapped back into reality and sat up gasping and whimpering. The last incident to happen was about two months ago. I was sleeping and started dreaming that I was going in a taxi somewhere. I couldn't see the taxi driver and he was just a mass of pitch black. The taxi suddenly went off road and headed toward the woods. I tried to get out, but the driver reached back and placed his hand in the center of my chest. I opened my eyes and I could still see the taxi and the trees, but behind that was my bedroom. The figure was turned and staring at me with his hands still on my chest, pinning me in place. I was freaking out. Now, my bedroom was more visible, but I still was stuck. I couldn't move, couldn't talk. My whole body was still asleep, but my mind and eyes were wide awake. I started to whimper, and my fiancé turned and threw his arm over me. I started crying when he did this because the pressure intensified. The dark figure was leaning closer and closer until we hit a tree. When we did, I shot up, gasping and crying. He woke up instantly and was trying to calm me down. I was terrified. I was able to go back to sleep after an hour or so. After that, to this day, I see a smudge of darkness pass by out of the corner of my eye. This was back in 2005 when I was 10 years old and still living in my old neighborhood. The house was very creepy. You would see things out of the corner of your eye and see shadows moving. Well, this is about my corner room of the basement where the old spirit was. I never really cared about seeing the shadows in the house because I was sleeping upstairs sharing a room with my brother, so I thought I'd be safe. Then he started to sleep in the basement, so I followed him down there. He didn't let me share the room, so I took the corner room next to him. One day, I was taking a nap and then woke up all of a sudden, but I didn't think anything of it. So I went to the bathroom and did my business. I came back to my room and I couldn't believe what I saw. I saw myself on my bed sleeping. 
I didn't come to grips with it until I heard chains moving. I looked towards the end of my bed and saw an old man chained up. It looked like he was trying to talk to me, but I started to scream. Then I felt being pulled toward myself and back to my body. I woke up screaming. My parents came downstairs and came to my room and asked me what's wrong. I told them about what happened. The look on my mother's face had confirmed that it wasn't a dream. She had told me the exact same thing happened to her, but thought it was a dream. Now that we both had the same thing happen to us, she called a friend to see if it was a dream or not. My friend's mom had a gift. She could see things others couldn't, and sometimes astral projects. Well, as soon as she walked into my room, she gasped. She could see the old man chained up by the bed. She went to him and started asking him why he was chained up. Apparently, he was chained up by some white people back in the 50s because he was a black man. He died of starvation and dehydration. The lady came and told us that we, all we needed to do was call a priest and bless the house and everything would be fine. The week after, a priest came in and started to bless the whole house. My mom's friend went back to the room and the old man was gone. Needless to say, I never slept in that room again. This was a long time ago. I was around 13 or 14 years old. So my brother had this cool friend. Every time we'd go, I would ask to go with. Well, this one time, we were hanging out. He was telling this story about some fire that happened a long time ago. I don't remember much about it, but he said that whoever hears it, a man would appear at night at your window. I don't think much about it at the time, because he liked to joke around. After we got home, I started thinking about it. Like, how would a man just appear out of nowhere and be at your window? I laughed it off, thinking it was stupid. So that night, I woke up suddenly because I needed to use the bathroom. Well, my bed was under the window, but facing towards the door, so I was able to see lights from cars. For a moment, I saw the light of a car pass. Then in between, a shadow of a man. I freaked out and I lay there thinking it was all in my head. Nope, again, the light of a car, then the shadow. The shadow looked like it had an old cowboy hat and wore a trench coat of some sort. While well, terrified, I laid there motionless. Each time a car passed, the shadow of a man was still there. After the sun started going up, the shadow began to disappear. Then I got a little courageous and I saw if I could see him. Well, I did. I caught a glimpse of him. I yelled, yelled for my parents. They came into my room, turned on the lights and asked me what's wrong. I told them that a man was staring at me from the window. My dad looked at the window and said, there's nobody there. I kept telling them that he was there, but they didn't believe me. Even when my brother came into my room, he said that I was just scared of the story his friend told us. Nobody believed me. I kept seeing him for a few nights then. Suddenly, he vanished. I no longer saw him. To this day, nobody has ever believed me. Has anyone ever got this feeling? When going up the stairs, that there is something behind you, but nothing going down the stairs. In my hometown, a small little town in southeast Idaho, where I basically grew up, we had a house, and I swear, there was something there, but only when I was going up. Despite whatever ability or whatnot to scare or sap paranormal stuff away, it was always there. When I went up the stairs, never had a problem going down the stairs. Now there was a problem at night when looking down. So when I was younger, I would never go down at night. Scared to all hell of the dark and all. It isn't related to the feeling of something in the closet or under the bed though. Though the closet is a whole other bag of worms altogether. That feeds into a phobia I have of small dark spaces. Anyhow, back to the story. I've never felt the same way about any other set of stairs in my life. Even old and creepy steps never bothered me like the ones in my own home. For context, the stairs in question are inside set of steps that go down about 8 to 12 steps to a landing, then turn to the left one step down, into the basement, be it night or day. It always felt like something was behind me on the way up, 
And at night, there was something down there. When I was about 12, my younger sister and I were friends with another family in the neighbourhood, the Andersons. They had three kids. Erica was my age, Simon was their 10-year-old son, and Katie was their 7-year-old daughter. We lived in a lake community and spent most of our summers at the beach with our neighbours. It was nice. Our parents were also friendly with the Andersons and we would have barbecues together all the time. One day, my dad swung by Anderson's house to pick up the three kids so they could go to the beach with me and my sister. Their mom, Cindy, was home by herself while her husband was at work. We were only at the beach for about 45 minutes when all of a sudden, Simon turns white as a sheet and grabs his stomach. He says to us, something isn't right. Then looks at his sister Erica and says, we need to go home right now. We thought he meant he was feeling sick and might throw up. So we tried to convince him to go to the beach house bathroom. Because of course, we wanted to stay at the lake. He adamantly refused, saying he wasn't going to be sick. He just felt like something was really wrong. He was clutching his chest and abdomen and breathing very fast. We finally went over to my dad and asked if he could drive us back to the Anderson house because Simon wasn't feeling well. So we all piled back into the car, sad to be leaving, but also worried about Simon. As we drove back to the house, Simon was growing more agitated in the car, begging my dad to please hurry because he needed to be at home. The beach was only a few minutes away, so we arrived at the house quickly. Simon ran up ahead of us inside and made a beeline for the bathroom. We thought he was hurrying because he had to throw up, but it turns out something much worse was happening in that house. We followed him inside. When Simon pushed open the door to the bathroom, his mother Cindy was leaving, leaning over the sink. Empty pill bottles were strewn around her on the counter and she was hysterically crying. Apparently, she had planned to kill herself while we were at the beach. She wrote a note and taped it to the bathroom door, basically telling her kids not to come inside the bathroom and to call their father. From what I recall, she had emptied and downed two or three bottles of heavy duty prescriptions. We called 911 and the ambulance rushed her to the hospital where they had to pump her stomach and monitor her carefully. She survived, thanks to her son's gut feeling. He had never had that sensation before to my knowledge and I have no clue how he knew what was going on at his house. All I know is that his persistence and intuition saved his mom's life. So I have a son that's six months old. I'm struggling to get enough sleep these days because he's a reckless little dude. Anyway, he woke up at 6.30 this morning. So I went to the living room to try and help him get back to sleep without bothering my girlfriend. I'm super tired at this point, so I lay down on the couch with him, hoping he'll get tired and maybe sleep for another hour. He doesn't. After about 30 minutes, he gets grumpy, so I put him in the baby nest next to me. I lay down on the couch again and suddenly, out of nowhere, I can hear a strange whisper calling my name. The sound is loud and clear, but like when sound is played in reverse. It was weird and super creepy. I sat up on the couch, goosebumps all over my body, looking around the dark living room trying to find the source. I forced thought it was my girlfriend, but she never whispers my name like that. She always calls me babe. She was sleeping. My boy's looking at me. Did he hear it too? I told my girlfriend this and she believed me instantly. She woke up several times that night with the feeling of someone watching us. It's not the first time she tells me this. I say it's her being overprotective, but after this morning, I'm not sure what to believe. I've experienced a few strange episodes with stuff disappearing and reappearing, chandelier swinging, light flickering, and crackling noises, but I've always blamed it on wind, temperature change, bad light bulbs, etc. I've always been fascinated with ghosts and paranormal activities, but never really been responsive enough to experience anything physical or specific like seeing, hearing or feeling. Until today. Anyone else experienced this? I can still hear the whisper in my head, god damn.
To begin with, you must understand the background to this event. I'm from England and live in a city called Bristol. If you're a UK primary school student, you often go on a camping trip in your final year, year six, age 10 or 11. Now this camping trip is usually to a safe and secure location, which is often used by many other primary schools. In my school's case, we went to PGL, Parents Get Lost, in Swindon, which is around an hour or so coach journey away from my primary school at the time. Now this is a very secure and safe location used by hundreds of schools, and my school plenty of times. It's full of various activities such as abseiling, giant swings, den building, etc. And it's a great experience to stay in a room with all your mates from primary school and away from your parents despite teacher supervision at all times. Now, one thing to note about the Swindon PGL site is that there's a main complex which is brand new, which is home to the canteen and hundreds of school hotel rooms. However, our school was given a building to the side, which was an old converted farmhouse. The teachers loved this, however, as it could only fit one school inside, which was ours. So there was no noise from all the other noisy schools if you were staying in the main new area. Boys room on the ground floor, with girls room above on the first. The farmhouse seemed slightly daunting to our ten year old selves, but we didn't care, as we were happy to be on holiday and in our rooms with our friends. Each day, you would be given a camp leader, essentially a PGL staff member, which would take you to see these cool and exciting activities during the day, such as den building or kayaking. So on this day, we got into our groups beforehand, and I was with a few of my mates and a few people in my class, with two of my teachers and, of course, the PGL staff member. We were then told what task we would be given today, and out of all the fun activities we were given, the nature trail. What a load of rubbish. Anyway, as the site is fairly small, all the activities are within relatively to another. For example, There's a thin stretch of woodland area surrounding the inner centre of the main field in a square shape. In the centre of this field are various activities, as well as the Swindon Town Football Club training facilities, which seem to share land with the PGL camp, presumably due to its secure and low-key nature that was constantly monitored to. Anyhow, we made our way to the nature trail, which was going to be completed around the square field through the woodland area. I remember all of us being really bored as we just wanted to do the fun activities my mates were doing, yet we were stuck on the nature trail. We headed down this fairly wooded area, but with a very large path down the middle, which easily fit the whole group of us. And of course, to our right, through the trees, we could see the glimpses of the fun activities in the centre of the square field. Yet as we stared down this large wooded path, it was empty with the only glimpse at the very far end being a large metal fence with barbed wire on top to ensure the boundaries were secure and no visitors could get into the PGL camp or the Swindon Town FC training facilities. We carry on down the path, stopping every so often for our PGL staff members to tell us some stupid fact. When suddenly, a dog appears at the very end of the trail. The dog begins to run around the trees surrounding us either side, and even coming very close to the group, but not touching us. All the girls go, ah, in delight of this dog. Yet it seemed strange, despite being a normal-sized dog, it seemed to be able to go through the trees as if it was invisible. Furthermore, although the lighting was darker due to it being a wooded area, visibility was still very good, but the dog seemed to be if it was just dark like a shadow. As the dog is still running around, the group and everyone is in awe of this dog. The PGL staff member seemed confused as if the dog shouldn't be here. Remember, this is a secure location for a children's camp and training facilities for Swindon Town FC only. That's when at the very bottom of the path, a figure of a man appeared maybe 50 metres from the group, and I still remember this in great detail. The man, just like the dog, was a dark black shadow. However, the man was dressed in full farmer's gear, as if he was from the 1900s. Although he was a shadow, you could make the outline of a farmer's cap, large boots slash wellies, and a large trench coat. The whole group was fixated on him, and even the PGL staff member said, what's he doing here? He shouldn't be here. Then just like that, he puts his hands to his mouth as if he was whistling, 
but no sound came out. Then, just like that, both him and the dog vanished in plain sight, right in front of all our eyes. I still remember all me and my mates sprinting down the path to look for this man, thinking he may have just turned the corner, and it was all our imagination. Just to reiterate, this is an enclosed and secure space, and the forest is very small. With the large field being in plain sight to our right, and the other side being fenced off, as there's a road outside of the campsite. Anyhow, we turn the corner and we find the den building activity, with a few of my schoolmates who were on this activity. I remember asking my friend, did you see a man and a dog? And they replied, no one has come this way. This experience was very strange and was witnessed by everyone in my nature trail group. I have no idea what it was, but I presume it was the old farmer of the land ghost, but I have no idea how the dog was also a ghost and disappeared on the whistle in front of all our eyes. All I can guess is that it was a ghost sighting, yet I've never heard of any shadow sort of ghost sightings and it was my only paranormal sort of experience. My dad also seen a ghost and I have heard of one or two other people who have also believed to see one. Yet none to what is compared to me and my mates seeing. This happened around 2012 when we were all around 10 or 11. Yet the PGL staff members saw it as well as my two teachers who were all confused by what we saw. It was not a scary experience but rather a weird one which has led me to more questions than anything. So about two years ago, I was hanging around with a group of mates in a small forest. Now we've done this more than once and never really had anything weird happen, except on two separate occasions. The first encounter we had was a weird formation of stars, slowly moving around in the sky in a triangle, and with this, within a span of two seconds going incredibly fast and moving out of view. All seven saw this, so I know it wasn't my imagination. Now the second encounter freaked us out the most. This happened at exactly the same location as where we saw the star formation. We were just casually hanging around in the midsummer, when around 2.30 out of the blue, I saw someone standing near us. Now I should point out, he was standing behind one of my friends, who I had just talked to three seconds ago. Everything about this guy strikes me as off-putting. I should point out it was about 30 degrees Celsius at the time, but this guy was wearing clothes you wear in Siberia during the winter. He also wore sunglasses despite it being night. Now the moment I saw him, I instantly felt an intense feeling of dread. The other felt this exact feeling as well. I asked him what the fuck he was doing here, and he just said, listening. After he said that, he moved a couple meters, but there was something really wrong with the way he moved, as it looked like this guy glided over the ground. Now because he got closer, I told him to stay the fuck back, and he just looked at me. That moment, my fight or flight kicked in hard, as I got the feeling this guy was a genuine threat, so I got ready to defend myself if he attacked us. But just a second or two after, he looked at me, he just vanished. Like we were all looking at him, and one moment he was there, and the other, he wasn't there anymore. After our initial confusion, we decided we should book it out of there, and we just ran as fast as possible, out of the forest. Now just a few notes. We didn't use any substances that could influence what we experienced. We didn't consume any drugs, alcohol, or anything else. We also all remember well what happened that day. We're also quite well known with that forest, and because it's quite small, we've been everywhere in there, and never have we found any signs of homeless people living in there. Back in 2019, I was pretty much depressed the whole year. Not really suicidal, but let's just say I stopped wearing a seatbelt, smoked twice as many cigarettes as I would have normally, and didn't care much about my well-being for the most part. Due to this depression and things getting worse mentally, I did a lot of dumb things, supernatural-wise. I've always known to not speak to the dead, knowing that when you speak to one spirit, the rest can hear you as well. I've always been extremely superstitious and believe in the paranormal and supernatural. Anyways, 
I live next to a huge cemetery and drive by it every day since it's right across from my neighbourhood. Due to my superstitions and believing that the dead can do things to us humans that aren't capable of, each day I would scream out of the window when passing the cemetery, begging for one of the spirits to get me in a car accident. This habit started on November 2nd, I believe, so I did that each day while driving past the cemetery. Lo and behold, November 6th, I was driving to work at about 4.30am. I go the same way every day and come up to a red light. Out of nowhere, and I kid you not, this was literally out of fucking nowhere, I heard a loud honk from behind me and was rear-ended by one of those big white RG and E trucks that fixed telephone poles and stuff. Since I was at the red light, it basically pushed my car forward into the middle of the intersection. And once again, out of nowhere, I was T-boned by some random ass old man in a van with his wife. I was driving an 05 Nissan Sentra at the time, and it was completely wrecked. Literally demolished, and I had not one scratch on me at all. My knees were extremely bruised. I have no idea how that happened, but that was pretty much it. This also happened literally on the main road coming out of my neighbourhood, about a mile down from the cemetery. There are never any cars this early in the morning, maybe one, but even that's rare for the most part. Also, while I was talking to the old man, they lived in a town literally 40 fucking minutes away and were driving to the park. The whole story is so weird and it honestly kind of creeps me out, but yeah. I was in an extremely bad financial situation also. I was stuck without a car for quite a bit. When I was driving by the cemetery begging to be in an accident, I meant that I wanted it to be fatal. So I think whatever spirit heard me, or whatever wanted to mess with me or something, I don't know. Take it as you will. Maybe this was an extremely weird coincidence, but if not, always remember to be careful what you wish for when speaking to the dead. I had a very scary experience a couple of years ago in Montana, and to this day, I can never quite figure out what happened. Summer of 2011, we just turned 21. One July weekend, my friend and I decided to go bar hopping. I was drinking, and my friend wasn't, since she was driving, so she gambled a little bit. We left about midnight to go gas up and cruise around. At this point, I was pretty fucking wasted. So while she went inside to pay for gas, I stayed in the van. As I'm sitting there listening to music, this Native American man and woman come up to me and ask me where I'm headed. I tell them nowhere and that we live here in town. Then they asked for a ride to their house and told me they lived in the county. I'm usually very cautious about people and never give rides to strangers, but for some reason, I told them to hop in. They say thank you and hop in the back seat. My friend comes back and gasses up, then gets back in the driver's seat. We blast the music and head to the back roads where we usually cruise around when we don't want to run into cops. As we were driving, I kept telling my friend which way to go to the couple's house. She keeps asking me who the hell I'm talking about, but I ignore her and send her the bottle that the couple was sharing with me. I'm talking away to them, and about 30 minutes later, they tell me to pull into this dirt road. I tell my friend to stop and pull in. And that's all I remember. I wake up at 3.30am in cold, pitch, black darkness. Our windows are down and our doors are open for some reason. I remember screaming at the top of my lungs for my friend to wake up. I scream at her to start the car and turn the lights on. When she turns the lights on, we're surrounded by nothing but trees and darkness. I look in the back seat and look around outside, but those people are nowhere to be found. There are also no houses where we stopped. I tell her, let's get the fuck out of here. The next day, I was still very terrified. I kept thinking about last night, wondering how she only took two shots of that bottle and how that would make her pass out with me like that for three hours. My friend was pretty scared too. I told her what I remembered and asked her what happened or if she remembers anything. She said there was nobody in the car with us and was wondering who I kept talking to, but she remembers taking a few shots from the bottle that mysteriously popped up out of nowhere, and she doesn't remember anything after she pulled into that dirt road. 
So the next day, we went cruising the back roads to try and find the place where we dropped those people off at. After driving a while, we hit this dead end, and I started getting a little bit of flashback. I remembered the sign that said no trespassing. The road and the way the trees looked were very familiar too. Then all of a sudden, I get this very eerie feeling and start feeling sick to my stomach, so we leave. Fast forward a couple of weeks later. The same friend and I decided to go get a ball. We start cruising and decide to hit the back roads again so we don't get pulled over. My friend is driving and I start drinking. An hour or two have gone by and we're both drunk. I tell her to pull over because I need to pee. She stops and I go behind the van to pee and I look over into the field and I see these red eyes staring at me. I pull up my pants quickly. Then I see the brake lights from the van and the van starts driving away. I start chasing her and I slap the back window and she stops. When I get to the driver door, I open it and ask my friend, what the fuck are you doing? She starts laughing and says, you told me to go, so I did. I pushed her out of the driver's seat and climb into drive. At this point, I'm scared sober, so we head home. The next day, she was acting weird and barely talking to me. So I decided to ask her why she was trying to drive off and leave me in the county last night. She told me that I was sitting in the passenger seat the whole time and that I told her to go ahead and leave. Then all of a sudden, I was pounding on the back window of the van. She said, when I looked at you in the passenger seat, your eyes were red. Just for some background information, I grew up in a reservation where ghost activity was fairly common. And my grandmother's house is known to be one of the most haunted houses on the res. When I was around six or seven, I was sleeping in the living room with my brother and I was already passed out. My brother began to hear footsteps coming down from the stairs that led to the living room and it was really late, so he was confused. Our living room didn't really have a wall towards the stairs it was more like railings, so he'd be able to see who was coming down from the stairs before they made it all the way down. The footsteps made it all the way down the stairs, and there was no one there. We were often told that our passed away grandfather would traverse the house at night, and he thought this was him. My brother tried his best to not get scared and watch TV, while the footsteps kept walking up and down the stairs. Eventually, he woke me up as comfort, and we both sat there and listened. Then all of a sudden, the footsteps bolted it up the stairs and back down, repeating this at least four times. Before we heard the steps go all the way upstairs, and all the doors started slamming. This woke up my grandmother, and when she opened her door to see what was going on, it stopped. We explained to her everything that happened, and she believed us right away like it already happened to her. <laughs> 